here. This is the energy equation for the universe. We had a kinetic energy term, we had a gravitational potential energy her term, and we had a total energy term, which turns out to be related to the curvature of the universe. And I justified it by saying, well, I can always have an integration constant, which I'll just uh, call K or energy, and it could be zero. It could be plus something or it could be minus something. So you have to have that when you integrate the differential equation. I added another term here, which has a little bit of a different flavor for it. It doesn't have a one over R squared on it. It doesn't get less important as the universe expands. These other terms get less important as the universe expands, but this one doesn't. It's not just an integration constant that you get when you solve a differential equation. This lambda term only came in when Einstein added an additional term to his uh, field equation for you know, the strength of gravity, which he was allowed to do. It wasn't excluded, although he had no motivation for doing it. Basically, what this corresponds to is energy. When, you, when the universe expands, there's more volume in it. There's more cubic meters in it. This energy is there for every cubic meter of a vacuum. It's a vacuum energy. And so as the universe expands and gets more cubic meters, this energy, total energy there expands also. It's so bizarre. So let's just sort of group things relative to the critical density here. That's sort of a more useful way to manipulate this equation. So now I've got the gravitational potential term here in terms of critical density. I'm going to define that as omega, the ratio of the actual density in the universe compared to the critical density. This one here I've defined as omega matter. That's just rho over rho crit. I've also defined what is the relative importance compared to the critical density of lambda, this dark energy. I've called this thing omega lambda defined by that. This equation here was your general equation with no dark energy, which is what most everybody thought was the correct equation until about 20 years ago. Bring back that blunder, actually. So I've added, to be more general here, a dark energy term. You could include the energy of radiation. That was only important early in the Big Bang, really in the first 100,000 years, when the photons had so much higher energy because of the redshift corresponding to a much higher temperature. Now we've been just ignoring this, but you could include that one also. So I'm going to write the equation again here. Just going to take this equation, uh, the master cosmology energy equation. This is the master energy equation of cosmology. Repeat the same equation that I had on the previous page. I added my omega lambda term at some early time. Omega radiation also needs to be included. Today, forget about it but in the first few tens of thousands of years, it might even be more important than this term right there. So I'm gonna include this just for complete, by defining these omegas, the ratio of this energy compared to the critical density. So I already defined my omega matter, I defined omega lambda, I could also define omega radiation, the same way. It's what is the energy density of radiation in the actual universe compared to the critical density? Because I love omega. Look at this term here. That was just basically the total energy of universe. I want to keep track of that also, what its ratio is compared to rho critical. So I want to keep track of all my energies here compared to the critical density. So I'm going to just define an omega, which is sometimes called the omega of the curvature of the universe. If, if the universe has a curvature, that also corresponds to an energy. And so algebraically here, I'm going to define the omega of the curvature of the universe. It's called omega k. k is the curvature of the universe. It's not omega matter. It's not the dark energy. This thing could, in general, be there even if there's no dark energy. And I've defined it as this term divided by h squared so that I can stick it into my equation. I cleverly defined this as minus the curvature because I know in advance here that if the curvature is positive, that means k is positive, the energy that that corresponds to, the, ener the energy of the universe, is negative. It's a bound universe. Whereas on the other hand, suppose that the universe had positive total energy. 
so that uh, omega k would be positive. I'm anticipating here that would be k of minus 1, a negatively curved universe. See, so I had to put the minus sign in here because they're backwards. If I define that, then I can write this whole equation in an amazingly simple form. A fairly common notation, which is convenient here, is to uh, go along with what Spark and Gallagher does. And, and other people use this also. There's a lot going on this slide here, but I, I wanted to make sure I didn't mess up. So I wrote it all out first. I have defined the cosmic scale factor compared with what the cosmic scale factor is today. The nice thing about defining A here is this makes things kind of simple here, you know, because I really care about today, <laughs> where, where we are. So what is A today for us at time t equals now? One. It's one. By definition, A is going to be one today, and in the past it was smaller. Some people will do the equations with R here. See, Hubble constant, mm, that was a dr dt, and I got a square here. So that's going to immediately transform into a dA dt if I take out the current value of Hubble constant. I've got an h squared over an h naught squared is what that is. And then there's, an a, there's also an a squared term that comes over here. So I decided to multiply that out and put it on this side. I left this term on the left-hand side. Then I put all of the uh, energy terms on the right-hand side. I moved omega. So I added omega matter here to the other side. I added this omega lamb to the other side. And this thing already was on the other side. That's omega k. By the way, I want to give you one other identity, which is going to be useful. Omega k is this kind of weird thing. If you don't want to call it omega k, that's okay. You can just call it this. See what that is? It's whatever it takes to add to omega matter and omega radiation and omega lambda to make one. Stuff everything in here. I rewrite everything as A, and I get a very powerful equation. It looks a little bit of a mess. I'm sorry, in general, we won't be able to analytically solve it. But I've got d80 t squared is this stuff squared. And then I've got my omega matter. I got my omega radiation, just to be complete. I got my omega curvature, and I got my omega lambda. Omega matter, of course, has been changing over time as the universe has expanded, you know, because the matter spreads out, um, but also the critical density uh, goes down as well. So what I've done here is very useful algebra. So I, I did a, a number of steps went down to getting this equation. Instead of giving omega matter, I decided to replace omega matter with what the omega matter is. That's rho over rho critical today, right now. So this thing here is rho naught over rho crit. It's again because I'm quite obsessed with the present time because that's where we are, the current epoch. Now they each scale in a different way. Radiation, because of the redshift factor, scales as, as a to the fourth. This one, if you just look at the equation here, happens to scale as a squared. A is, remember, is getting bigger and bigger with time. It started at zero. It's gotten up to one today, and in the future, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. This term really died fast. <laughs> this term here is dying. And this term is still there. That only, that only fell off as a squared. It could be significant. And this term, this is the interesting one, uh, omega lambda has been, when a was small, this was nothing. You didn't matter what lambda was, as I think I mentioned in the early universe. In fact, in the early universe, uh, a was so small, this one didn't matter either. But now, you know, this one's become more important. And this one has been waiting the most patiently of all because it's not divided by a at all. As the universe gets bigger, if there's any dark energy in it, it's going to take over. This is a very useful equation. It tells you everything that's going to go on. You did a bunch of solutions where we ignored this. So we did one solution where we ignored this, and we ignored this, and we ignored this, and we did the radiation. So we had just this one term here. That was a pretty good description of the universe in its early stages, first uh, 10,000 years. Then we left this one out, we left this one out, and we went to a matter-dominated universe. And we got the t to the two-thirds solution for that one. So that was just that one. That was an interesting solution for a critical density universe. I also did an empty universe. What's an empty universe? It's where things are so spread out, the radiation is negligible, and things are so spread out that the matter is negligible too. What happens if I ignore these two terms and I also ignore dark energy? 
then I got a super easy solution here. It was a constantly expanding universe. A just was time divided by T naught. We also, at the end here, did uh, a future universe. Sorry, where it looks like we're going to go there. The big rip, it looks like, where the dark energy dominates and all these other terms have died because A is getting so big. And we got an exponential runaway universe here. So we've solved literally every one of these individual terms dominating. We were able to solve the differential equation rather trivially. But when you put them all in there, it's not, <laughs> it's a mess. I take the square root of everything in here. That was pretty easy. So that goes away. These go away. And then I've got this very important functional operational square root that keeps track of all the energy densities of the universe. I wanted to make it even more useful, more operational. So I decided to use the fact that A, suppose I'm looking at something that happened back in time when the universe was smaller. The ratio of how much smaller the universe was then, when I'm looking at the object, maybe it's sending me photons. It's really the only way I can look at it pretty much, except for maybe gravity waves. So the ratio of how big the universe was compared to how big it is now at the time that the photons get to me, that is by definition, one over one plus Z, the redshift factor. These equations can both be useful depending on what you're trying to solve for. But if you're an observationally oriented person who wants to think of things in terms of their redshifts, I find a very useful, not just me, way of replacing all of these A things here with one over one plus Z. So I've taken the same equation. I did a number of steps here. So this is like several algebra steps to go to here, a few algebra steps to go to here. I took the square root of the whole darn equation, and then I converted all these, uh, like that's a to the minus three. That becomes one plus z cubed. A, a to the minus four here becomes one plus z to the fourth. And there's your a squared is one plus z squared. Oh, this one doesn't have any redshift dependence. So that doesn't have any one plus z on it at all. It's one plus z to the zero there. So this master equation here in a very useful form, it's so important. Spark and Gallagher is 826. Much why did I say this is the greatest equation since sliced bread here? It's got dA dt on this side. And on this side, it's got stuff which these are all constants here. If I knew what these constants were, I know this is complicated, but it's just a function of a. So I've got the time derivative of a on this side is just the square root, you know, a function of a on that side. I see how that could be solved, not analytically maybe, not like the cases we did, but it could be solved with an integral. It could be numerically solved. In other words, what I do is I move the dt over to this side. See what I'm doing here? This is the next step. I'm just going from this equation down to this equation. So I move the dt over here, and there's no other times in it. I just got a dt all by itself there. I love that. All the messy stuff, which is a function of a, remember, a is this r of t. That's what we've been trying to figure out. All that stuff goes over onto a mess on the, right, on the other side of the equation, a mess which I could integrate. Uh, numerically, just put it on your computer. If I integrate this one, I integrate this one. What am I going to get? Time is a function of A. We've already done that a few times before. If you know what time is a function of R is, you just invert that to find out what R is as a function of time. I took this curly brackets term here, and I took the square root of it, and then there was an A down there. So this is just a very beautiful restatement in a solvable way, a integrable way of my uh, energy equation. For other purposes, you might want to write this as if you want to convert dA into dz, you see you're going to get a, a square, two steps of algebra. Very useful uh, equation that I can integrate also very useful equation I can integrate. Depends on whether you want to do your integral in A or whether you like to do your integral in Z. And this thing here, where I took the curly brackets and just expressed it in terms of Z, it's called E of Z. This thing here in the curly brackets is called E of A. The reason I mention this is to make a connection to something that I put on the course webpage on week eight, distances measured in an expanding universe. 
the single most practical summary for people who actually want to do cosmological calculations that I've ever seen, and he put it on archive on Astro PH in 1999, and we all just refer to this. And he uses this is his master formula here. He took it from other people. This is even more useful, really, than what's in Spark and Gallagher. Although you can see it's really just a different version of the same equation. We now know R of t. Right? We could solve it numerically and make all those graphs. We know A of t, right? It's the same thing. It's just R over R naught today. A of t just happens to be 1 today. R of t happens to be R naught today. So we've got that solved. Yeah, I had a drawing of this. We've got various solutions to this, you know, straight lines, exponentials. We've got all these solutions, and then they cross over as one energy takes over from another energy being important. Hooray! We've got R of t as a function of t, and you, you know how to do it, uh, just like the professionals here.